Hi guys. Um, so like Asad said, my name is Hanan. I'm 20 years old and I'm in my last year at Queen's University. There's a lot of things about my life that make me a minority. I come from a Muslim Indian family. Muslims in India, not a majority. In another lighter sense, I can't ride a bike. That's also a minority. Well, at least I think so. <laughs> but the thing is, sometimes I'm put into the minority group for a reason that I shouldn't be placed in there, and that's because I'm a girl, and that needs to change. So from October 15th to October 21st, I was at the Girls' 20 Summit in Paris. The summit brings together one representative from each country, so I represented Canada, and so each G20 country and one from the African Union. And we get together and we go through the G20 agenda, the economic agenda this year, and talk about how it relates to girls and women and the issues that we have globally and what solutions that we can bring forward to make things work out for all of us. Now, it's really easy for me to stand up in Theological Hall at this great university and talk about this discussion, this discourse, that girls and women need more of a voice. But I don't want it to stop at that. I don't want it to stop with you guys going home saying, oh, you know what, 50% of the world's population is not using its full potential. Let me go ponder that, Alpies. <laughs> I want actions to be made. And I can't do that because I've lived a very, very fortunate life. So I don't have many traumatic stories to tell. But I want to tell you the stories of two people that I've met, a group of women I've met, and another university student that I've met, and the steps that they've taken and how that relates back to us. You'll notice at the logo of the summit, it says 3.3 billion ways to change the world. And the reason why that is, is because there's 3.3 billion girls and women in the world. And each girl and woman, and each, one who, each person who stands up for a girl or woman, represents the way to change the world. So I want to start my journey in India. Two years ago, I was involved with the National Bank of Agriculture and Rural Development in southern India, NABARD. And what they do is they create microfinance programs that are targeted towards girls and women. And I want to talk about this fantastic group of women who took advantage of that opportunity. They come together, they have these awesome matching outfits, which I think everyone should own, <laughs> and they form a group and they ask for a loan. And the way the collateral portion of it works is because it's such a close-knit social group that if one person defaults on their own loan, sorry, then there's shame brought down on the whole group. So there's a lot of pressure to be responsible with the money that you're given and to use it for correct things. So these women get loans, and then they go to these training institutions. Sorry, the photo's a bit fuzzy. But on these metal frames that are stretched out, they're sari fabrics. Now, saris are traditional Indian dress that can be worn from everyday occasions to the most formal of occasions. And so these women were learning how to bead and thread and embroider these saris and then sell them for a profit to their own community, to their own family, to their own friends, to the people around them. And that's a very practical way to make money and start a business. So now this is a fair that was run by the Reserve Bank of India. And they were trying to bring financial inclusivity, they were trying to bring financial means to the villages. So in villages in India, there's no such things as ATM machines or bank you know, locations, anything like that. No branches you can go to and deposit some money. So they're trying to bring economic commerce back to these villages and create economic development. So each one of these stalls represents a business. And these businesses are started by you know, education, training, all run by these banks and all run, run by these NGOs. But the point is you have to take advantage of them. And I'm really happy to say that most of these women, I mean, sorry, most of these stalls were run by amazing women who put their heart and soul into fixing their community. So this lovely lady here, everything that she's selling is biodegradable and it's all for farming. So that's pesticide-free fertilizer, pesticide-free, um, sorry, chemical-free fertilizer, chemical-free pesticides, um, chemical-free plant food, everything. And it helps her community because the food that she eats is now chemical-free. The food that her children will eat, her grandchildren will eat, the people that she cares about will eat will be chemical-free. And that was started because of her initiative. And when she started, she was illiterate. She couldn't read, she couldn't write, she had no means of financial literacy either. And look how far she's come. This is a new machine that they're implementing in these villages where you use a thumbprint. If you can't read or write, you can't sign because you don't know what you're signing, you don't know what you're reading. So by using a thumbprint, that's how you complete a transaction. So they're bringing these little machines that we're so used to into all of these villages. And who's running it? A woman. And it was her idea. It was her, you know, I guess, desire to make her community a better place, a more global place. And things, sorry, that was a kind of a drastic change. <laughs> we'll stay on that for a while. And the thing is that these, these women don't have to always you know, do projects that revolve around commerce or economics. I'm an economics major, but I know that doesn't interest anyone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know, I know it's sad to say, but it's true. <laughs> 
So these are toilets that were also invented by a woman. And what they are is that they divide, they divide the two functions, I guess. And they help, you know, give one function back to the environment <laughs> and one gets deposited into waste. So it really helps because it makes like, it, it's just a safer environment for even the children who play around the toilets. Because it's not just a thing as a play area or, you know, a lounge room, a TV room in the village. There isn't. This is a sustainable water well that was come up with a woman and her family. What it does is constantly pumping on its own with an axis, so you don't need to sit there for hours pumping the water for your family, for your community, which means the girls whose job was to do this can now go to school. They can now play. They learn how to have a childhood again. And that was run by a woman. And I know these are very drastic examples because they're working conditions that we're not used to. They're working in environments that we don't know anything about. But the point is, it's an example that needs to be made because it shows how much a girl and a woman can do when the smallest of barriers are broken down, such as the ability to get a loan. This is my second story. This is Maryam. Maryam was a Saudi Arabian delegate at the summit last week, uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, sorry. Um, and she's an amazing, amazing girl. Like, she's 19 years old, I believe, and she's also a university student. She goes to university in Jeddah, where she lives, and these are Miriam's friends, her support group. And together, they have started a group called ESMID. Um, I'm going to read it out here because I don't have the memory skills that our previous speakers do. <laughs> and also, I don't want to screw up their definition of their group. So there's a project that seeks to expand, enrich, and deepen the feminist discourse in Saudi Arabia. They want to change we talk, the way we talk about gender, feminism, rights, and sexuality. They want to introduce new concepts, new problems, new ways of seeing the issues, and new ways of thinking about solutions. Ultimately, Esmid wants to broaden the horizons of public debate. And the reason why I was so drawn to Miriam and her project was because of the name that they chose for their project, Esmid. Now, that's an ancient rock from the region of Saudi Arabia. And a chemical is extracted from this rock and was used for coal, casual for Indians, eyeliner in the modern day sense of the word. And this coal used to be put on by males and females, and it protects against allergies, and it was also a symbol of beauty and strength and valor. But as time went on, it became gender specific. I learned it became associated with females. It became associated with very feminine qualities, with a sort of like trophy wife attitude. And they want to change that. They want to move past that. And they're fighting against the negative connotation of feminism as well, because there is a negative connotation sometimes. And they want to say that the battles that girls and women write are the battles that a community fights together. And I'm trying to say that these steps that we're fighting aren't trying to say that girls and women are better than men or, you know, they should have more of a power. We don't want to, I guess, change the focus of development, but sort of widen the net, create a better scope to affect everyone. So how does this relate back to us at Queen's, at the Ontario Hall, at this lovely theological hall? Well, there's problems with the way girls and women are represented in our own backyards. In 2010 and 2011, 28% of engineering students were female. That's dismal. And that's one of the highest percentages across the board in Canada. So in STEM programs, so science, technology, engineering, and math, there's a huge male-dominated world. And a lot of it is because people feel that, you know, women aren't as good as men in math. And that's nonsense. So I want to encourage everyone to stop thinking about aid as a top-down technique. It doesn't trickle down. You don't need UNESCO or, you know, UN women to go out there and say, oh, we're going to create a day for women in technology and then see the effects come down. Change starts from the ground up and everyone needs to step up and sort of, you know, contribute in whatever capacity they can. It doesn't have to be starting your own business. It doesn't have to be creating a new toilet. And it doesn't even have to be creating workshops for Saudi Arabian girls and men. It just has to be encouragement to a girl or woman saying, no, you should go out for that engineering you know, degree. It'll be great. You'll be great. Because we need representation in every field in the world. So if you want to go back to the theme of the conference, very literally nomads, if everyone makes a step, if everyone encourages someone else, another girl, another woman, then together we become a caravan of lovely camels, you know, making a change in the world. So that's what I want to say. Everyone should make a step, and that's how it comes together. And the way I want to drive that home is with one last activity that I learned while I was in Paris. It involves audience participation, so please don't be shy. So can everyone just clap really quickly for me for like two seconds? Not for me, just in general. <laughs> okay, that's it, that's it. Have you noticed that when we come to all these inspiring speeches, when we clap, no one knows what the hell we're saying. It's just noise, we're like seals. It doesn't mean anything. So I want to introduce you to the United Farm Workers Clap. 
This was introduced in California in the 1950s and 1960s. And the California migrant farm workers had like stood for something. They stood for unions and for organization and for momentum. And the way they expressed their clap was like this. Sorry, hold on. Okay, everyone follow me. Ready? See, it builds up, it creates charisma. It's great, that, do you feel a buzz in the room? Now, during, or, or not. <laughs> during the Obama campaign at a caucus, this woman piped up from the back and said, you know what, I have an addition to this clap. It's a modern day version, and I really like this version. So let's try that again. So that final, oh, <laughs> final thud almost. <laughs> Can we try that again properly, <laughs> okay? <laughs> So that final thought at the end represents, or should represent, that goal that we're all reaching for. But how does it all start? With one clap, and everyone can clap. And that one clap represents a person, a man, a woman, an idea, or a nomad. So I'm asking everyone to leave the room today when the conference is done and do a clap. <laughs> and, um, you know, just make a change, make a movement, and together we can reach that final thud and be one of the three points of able in ways to change the world. Thank you.